Thank you. <laughs> well, thanks so much, everybody. It's really great to be here, and um, thanks for braving this terrible weather to come out tonight. Now, I'm going to be talking about ideologies and how they shape our world and in some ways shape our minds and shape our entire relations. And ideologies are everywhere even if we don't recognize them as such. Some ideologies, like communism, announce themselves. They say, this is communism, and this is what it's like, and this is what we intend to do. Some ideologies, like capitalism, develop gradually as means of justifying existing economic or political power structures. Some, like consumerism, aren't really identified as ideologies by almost anyone. And some, like neoliberalism, actively deny their own existence. <laughs> now, an ideology is, is a system of thought which structures the way that we see the world. A successful ideology is one that tells you there's no other way of seeing the world. And a really successful ideology is one that persuades almost everyone that there's no other way of seeing the world. And tonight I'm going to talk about three really successful ideologies. Capitalism, consumerism and neoliberalism. I'm going to talk about the way in which they have structured our thoughts, changed our minds and structured the world around us, and the way in which they are, I believe, driving us collectively to, towards disaster. What we need to do to break free from them, and the need to create a new ideology of our own based around the survival of humanity and the rest of the living planet. I don't have all the answers, but I hope at the very least to so some productive questions in your mind. And we'll be coming to those in the second half. So these three form a kind of unholy trinity, as, as Natalie mentioned. You could see capitalism as the father, consumerism as the son, and of course, uh, neoliberalism has to be the unholy ghost because that's the one which isn't supposed to exist. <laughs> and uh, capitalism is one of those notions, I mean, it's more than an idea, it's more than a practice. It's this all-consuming system which persuades us that it's the only thing there has ever been, that we are all innately capitalists, that we're born capitalists, that we've always been capitalists. But it really isn't like that. Until the mid-16th century, the, the idea of a system where the means of production are privately owned and used to generate profit and to generate and accumulate capital was completely alien to most of the world's people. It wasn't really until the dissolution of the monasteries in England and the creation of a general market in land that capitalism as a practice we would recognize today kicked off. And as a generalized system, one in which land, labor, and money are generally commodified, as Karl Polanyi would see the system, it's really only about 200 years old. But it's so fantastically successful as an ideology that it's almost impossible, even for the critics of capitalism, such as myself, to see their way out of it. It captures our minds with extraordinary effect. Now, I believe there are three ways in which it is inherently incompatible with the survival of our life support systems, the survival of life on Earth. And it's amazing. These things seem so obvious once you identify them, but because of the power of ideology, and a really powerful ideology is one which isn't just all-pervasive and sort of shuts down other ways of seeing the world, but it's one which is regarded so much as common sense that we don't even question it, we don't even identify it in our minds. We don't wake up in the morning and say, well, as a capitalist, I believe so-and-so. 
or because this is a capitalist world, it therefore follows. We, we don't see ourselves that way. We, we're completely immersed in this system, but it is the water, or rather the plastic soup in which we swim. We can't see it, not because it's so small, but because it is so big. And so these fundamental flaws as I see them, and I say this as someone who, who came to this position reluctantly, uh, I, I'm not a communist, despite the claims of many people on the right. Um, I, I, I struggled to get to this position of calling myself an anti-capitalist because it's a bit like saying God is dead in the 19th century. It's secular blasphemy. But to sort of gradually realize that it is fundamentally incompatible with our own survival, this blasphemy has crept up on me and become so obvious to me, at any rate, once it, it appeals to my mind that I can't understand how I couldn't see it before. And there are three ways, as I say, in which I believe it is incompatible. The first is that the net product of capitalism, or, or the aggregate product of everyone's profit-generating activities, is economic growth. The system is deemed to fail if economic growth even falters. And, and governments, and indeed everybody embedded within the capitalist system, does what they can to get growth back on track. And continued perpetual growth would be absolutely fine if the planet were growing at the same rate. But perpetual growth on a finite planet is, as we know, a recipe for catastrophe. The, the argument that many people use is that, well... You know, growth can be decoupled from material resource consumption. As we switch from a goods economy to a service economy, we can keep growing and everyone can have more and more money, but we'll consume fewer and fewer goods. Well, it's a lovely idea in theory. But bizarrely, we're heading in exactly the opposite direction. So while in the last two decades of the 20th century there was a relative decoupling, not an absolute decoupling, we weren't using fewer goods, we were just using fewer goods or fewer materials per unit of economic growth, in the 21st century so far there's been a recoupling. We're now using more materials per unit of economic growth. Even in countries like this where we've moved further into a service economy. Why? Well, it turns out that services use an awful lot of goods. If you fly on a plane or make a film or do any of the activities that we regard as service activities, it turns out you have to use an awful lot of goods. And while you can demonstrate relative decoupling in some countries at some periods of history, no one has ever shown absolute decoupling of material resource consumption, as far as I'm aware, last time I looked, um, um, in any country at any time. In other words, while economic growth continues, nowhere have we seen an absolute decline in the amount of materials that we are using. Already, we have burst through the planetary boundaries, basically telling us what is a sensible level of consumption. According to estimates brought together by Jason Hickel, a great thinker in this area, um, we could... Uh, the the uh, sensible level of maximum consumption is about 50 billion tonnes of material per year. We're currently using 80 billion tonnes. If we um, carry on as we are with business as usual, by 2050 we'll be using 180 billion tonnes of materials. Now if we were to carry on growing at current rates, 3% a year. It doesn't sound very much, does it? But you use the rule of 72, divide 72 by your growth rate, and you find your doubling time. That means that the global economy doubles every 24 years. And then again, and then again. Um, and, and so already we're at this, so we're at breaking point, but we want to double in 24 years. Well, if you carry on at current rates of growth, and do everything possible to try to decouple, um, in other words, maximum carbon taxes, maximum efficiency, um, just throw everything at this problem that we know how to throw at it, we could possibly get that 
material resource consumption down from 180 billion tonnes by 2050 to 132 billion tonnes. Still, two and a half times the amount which is now recognised by quite a few people as being about the maximum we should be using. So, it seems impossible, really, to reconcile economic growth with the protection of a habitable planet. You're constantly trying to run down a rising escalator. And that escalator rises further and further and faster and faster as we go. It becomes harder and harder to do that. You're constantly fighting the trend of economic growth. And so if the system, as it seems, is necessarily generates growth and is dependent for its apparent success on growth, that system appears to me to be incompatible with our well-being, our prosperity, our survival. But it doesn't end there, because there's a second feature of capitalism which is much less discussed. In fact, amazingly, it's scarcely discussed at all, even though it is the implicit assumption behind all capitalist relations. It's an extraordinary idea. And it goes as follows. It says, the money in your bank account, or indeed the money in someone else's bank account that you can borrow, equates to a right to buy or right to own a certain amount of natural wealth. And the more money you have or have access to, the more natural wealth you can acquire, regardless of what the impact on anyone else who might also want that natural wealth might be. So if you have enough money, you can buy a vast tract of land. You can buy a private jet and use up our atmospheric natural wealth that all of us could do with. You can buy bluefin tuna sushi. You can buy mahogany panelling for your super yacht. You can buy as many giant homes as you want. You can have two homes, three homes, four homes, five homes, as some people have in this country, while many have none. It's a remarkable idea that somehow that figure translates into that right. That idea has never been codified in a charter of rights, not in a coherent way, not in a way that recognises that extraordinary transfer of values from a number to granting yourself a huge chunk of natural wealth which basically takes that wealth away from everybody else. And the only thing which looks anything like a justification of this is what John Locke came up with in his second treatise of government, which was the, what, what's called the labour theory of property. It's the idea that you acquire the right to property by mixing your labour with the land. This was landed property, but the same idea has been uh, extrapolated to cover all forms of natural wealth. And so what Locke said was that you turn up on a piece of land, maybe you dig a hole, you do something to show that you've mixed your labour with it, and that land becomes yours. Well, how could it possibly become yours if it was already someone else's? Aha! In the beginning, says Locke, who was a, uh, a secretary to the original British, um, the lords governing the original British colonies in the Americas, um, in the beginning, he said, everywhere was America. In other words, all land was what he considered a terra nullis, owned by no one. Of course, the fact that there were indigenous people on that land who had just been massacred and driven out and killed by disease and all the rest of it, didn't seem to be a concern that affected him very much. It's a terra nullis. So there's a year zero at which someone else, the colonist, can turn up and dig a hole and he's mixed his labour with the land and that land is then his. But the weird thing which Locke never examines is that it then remains his, or hers, but we know it's his, in perpetuity that that person who has mixed their labour with the land can then pass it on to their good-for-nothing son or daughter, and they can then own it, having done no labour on the land whatsoever. Whereas if someone else comes along and digs a hole, not only do they not get to own the land, they'll probably get arrested for trespass. 
How does that possibly work? So why is it that there's just one arbitrary year at which someone can assert ownership by mixing their labour with the land? Locke does not explain. Moreover, it turns out there's an, another implicit assumption in his treatise that your labour mm, isn't just your labour, it's the labour of those who labour for you. So you would have thought it was the actual person who digs the hole who becomes the owner of the land. No, it's the person who instructs the person to dig the hole who becomes the owner of the land. Now, if in the Carolinas, as, at, 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 which is where Locke's experience was, you wanted to own a large tract of land, you needed a lot of people digging holes for you. What he produced was a treatise for the rights of the slave owner. It was a slaver's charter, even though it was never explicitly acknowledged as such. And that became the basis of the entirety of English property law. Quite an extraordinary basis. And even if somehow you could make, all, make sense of all that weird, convoluted thinking, it still raises the question of why labour? Why this arbitrary thing? Why not assert your right to the land by pissing on it? That's what a lot of animals do. It would make a lot more sense, wouldn't it? There's, no, there's just no logic in this process at all, but that completely illogical idea, and this is what I mean by the retrofitting of the ideology of capitalism to the practice of capitalism. In other words, you create the justification after you've started doing it, and boy, aren't we all good at that. Um, this... This, this notion is completely illogical and it leads to a series of absolute disasters when it comes to issues of social justice and of ecological justice. So the UN Charter will say, you know, everyone's got a right to the enjoyment of property. Well, no, we don't. If some people are taking the lion's share, it means other people don't have a right to that enjoyment. It says that every generation can... Um, uh, it can, should exist in freedom, but we, subsequent generations have no freedom if the natural wealth has already been locked up. And what we see in this charter, effectively, that John Locke has created, is not just the charter of the slave owner, the charter of the accumulator against the majority, it's also a charter for intergenerational theft where one generation can lock everything up, depriving younger people of the rights that that generation has enjoyed, the rights to the use of natural wealth. And when you combine that with the previous characteristic of capitalism I meant, uh, mentioned, this, this drive to growth, you realise that capitalism is basically a pyramid scheme in two senses of the word. It's a pyramid scheme in, in that it's um, um, apparent current economic health is built on future unsustainable debts and it's a pyramid scheme because it generally leads to the very rich people building vast mausoleums to themselves. So that's number two problem with capitalism. The, the, the third problem is related to both of those but it's subtly different. It's a promise that everyone can aspire and achieve, eventually, private luxury. And it's only because of this promise, I think, that we tolerate the system, because we are all in our own minds, as Steinbeck would say, temporarily embarrassed millionaires. <laughs> we all think we're going to get there eventually, don't we? We think, sort of, you know, we might, might be downtrodden now, but eventually we're going to be that guy sitting in the big mansion on the hill. The, the, the problem is, there is literally not enough physical or ecological space for everybody to do that. If everybody in London had their own tennis court and swimming pool and art collection and playground and, and, and vast mansion with their huge basements and stuff, London would cover half of England. England would cover half of Europe. Where would all the other people go? It just doesn't exist. The atmospheric space does not exist for everyone to have a private, private plane or a private yacht. There's not enough bluefin tuna for everyone to eat bluefin tuna sushi. There's not even enough land for everyone to eat meat. The only reason why some people are able to pursue private luxury is that other people aren't. 
And yet the entire justification of the system is based on the principle that we shall all pursue private luxury. Now, were we to use growth, as capitalism promises, to float all boats and ensure that everyone achieves private luxury, with the current way that growth is distributed, where it takes $111 of growth to generate $1 for the poorest 10% of the global population, we would need an economy 175 times bigger than today's for everyone uh, to earn at least $5 a day in wages. It would take 200 years to get to that point. 175 times more economic activity than today is not a formula for universal prosperity. It's a formula for universal destruction. The end of prosperity. The end of well-being. So capitalism has its problems. Let's move on to ideology number two, consumerism. Now, you know, a lot of you will question me calling this an ideology. Surely consumerism is just something we do, something we just fall into. We just want stuff and we buy it. But again, it wasn't ever thus. I mean, it, it might seem to be just an innate thing. We just obviously, we're greedy, we want stuff. My father-in-law uh, father told me something very interesting. He's an economic historian and um, he was brought up in the Liverpool docks. And during the war, he was evacuated at the age of eight to North Wales. And he and his younger brother stayed with um, this woman for a couple of years in North Wales who lived in this tiny cottage without even glass in the windows, no electricity, no running water, uh, very frugal, very, very basic meals, um, the same clothes piled on layer after layer uh, when she needed to keep warm. Um, almost no heating at all. And he said the extraordinary thing was she had no material aspirations whatsoever. She didn't want any more stuff than she had. I was just amazed. I said, how could that possibly be? And he said all her aspirations were either spiritual aspirations or community aspirations. She wanted to get closer to God. She was a nonconformist, very religious, went to chapel every week or even more than once a week. Um, and that was her real ambition, was to be a good Christian. But she also wanted to be a good member of the community and to sort of help other people who were in trouble and all the rest. And her entire aspirational world was built around those aims. And what he's seen in his much greater lifetime is that an extraordinary shift where fewer and fewer people had those aspirations and more and more and more people had the aspiration which nearly everyone has today, which is just for more and more stuff. This is a constructed way of seeing the world. Consumerism, which could basically be defined as the idea that we achieve well-being by acquiring goods and services, is something which has been handed to us by a system of thought creation through marketing, through advertising, through the think tanks who are always coming up with more and more justifications for crazy stuff, but especially through an incredibly powerful political mechanism which we scarcely ever regard as such, which is celebrity. Celebrity is the handmaiden of consumerism. It is absolutely essential to the system. And what we see with the rise of consumerism over the past century has been a rise in celebrity culture running alongside it. This is why there has been a rise in celebrity culture. The reason is that celebrity exists to sell stuff. That doesn't mean that every single person who's a celebrity has the aim of selling stuff. But it means that as a general trend and as an obsession, as a societal obsession, this trend has developed as a result of the necessity for corporations to connect with customers. Because if you are a corporation whose identity is a filing cabinet in Panama City, 
And if your real physical presence is some grey monolith of an office block owned by a series of owners who become more and more obscure as they retreat into their shell companies, then you've got no means of connecting with the hearts and minds of the people you want to sell stuff to. So celebrity becomes the machine, that the mask that the machine wears. You recruit celebrities to be the friends and neighbours of the people you want to reach. They are there fundamentally, as a class, they are there to sell you stuff, to talk to you, to cajole you, to be the, the public presence of that corporation that has no public presence and to make you want the products which subtly or not so subtly, Kim Kardashian, they are gradually pushing into your feeds. And we've now reached the point at which celebrity culture has taken over almost everything, including politics. You basically become a, um, a political leader if you have sufficient celebrity, sufficient name recognition, and that tends, so it seems, to trump almost everything else. <laughs> and I don't think, I hope I don't need to go on at great length about what consumerism is doing to the living planet or indeed to our state of mind. Um, and the reason, I mean, you know, we could all look in horror at the completely insane products which are being pushed at us with the help of advertising and marketing and celebrity. We could talk about the... Um, the 3D pancake bot, which will, if you feed a, a, a photo into it, will print a pancake, a 3D pancake, in the shape of that photo. So it could be your nearest and dearest, or it could be a, a, a rustic scene, or the Mona Lisa, or your dog's bottom. You will get a pancake in that shape. Of course, the reality is that this huge piece of kit will take up far too much space in your kitchen, and after a week, you'll throw it out with all the rare and precious materials that went into constructing it. There are smartphones for dogs. <laughs> I'm not making this up. A, you can buy a smartphone for your dog. There are portable watermelon coolers. There are snow saunas, so you can step into this room and, and pull a switch and snow will come out of the ceiling. There's a spider-proof shed. <laughs> There's beer for cats. Honestly, if, if you can imagine it, someone has invented it. In fact, if you can't imagine it, it's even more likely that someone has invented it. But all this stuff, I mean, it seems like just ridiculous exotica, but this stuff is essential to the, the capitalist model because once people who've got disposable incomes, who are the people of interest to capitalism have had their needs met and then their basic desires met and then their um, less basic desires met and then their extreme desires met. The only way in which the system can keep growing is to produce more and more ridiculous stuff. It can't grow otherwise. And then you have to generate the desire for that more and more ridiculous stuff. So, so, so extreme consumerism is really intrinsic to the models which we've discussed so far. And I don't think it does us any good, our mental health, any good whatsoever. It creates this perpetual culture of evaluation, of envy, of competition, which is then enhanced by the third member of the unholy trinity, the one that dare not speak its name, neoliberalism. Now, when neoliberalism was created as a doctrine, really in a conference in 1938 by people like um, Friedrich Hayek and Ludwig von Mises, they were quite happy to call themselves neoliberals and to say, we've invented this thing called neoliberalism. But by the 1950s, the name had more or less disappeared and no other term was gen then generally used with which to replace it. It was this self-denying ideology. It was an ideology which claimed it wasn't there because they quite rightly recognised that that is the most powerful ideology of all, the one which shapes our thinking and where we can't even put our finger on that thing shaping our thinking. And neoliberalism is basically a system of thought which says 
The legitimate sphere for social change is not politics, but is this thing we call the market. And they're always quite careful not to define the market too closely. Because what they're really doing is transferring power from the democratic sphere towards the oligarchic sphere. Because the market basically means money, and in the market, those with the most money have the most votes. Will Davis, the um, great political thinker, has um, put it more succinctly. He says, neoliberalism is a disenchantment of politics by economics. And broadly speaking, the idea says there should be no interference in market relations. Any form of political interference in those relations is illegitimate. So, that taxation should be minimised or done away with altogether. Regulation should be minimised. Trade unions should be stamped out. Public protest is illegitimate. Basically, what neoliberalism does is to say the market will determine who the virtuous people and who the non-virtuous people are. It will rank society according to people's worth. And if people fall through the gaps, well, tough. They deserve to fall through the gaps. They are the, the undeserving poor. It sort of really resurrects this um, 17th century idea that you can tell who God favours because they've got the money. In my experience, it's probably the other way around. But uh, anyway, the, 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 you'll see this extraordinary spread of this ideology um, uh, pushed in particular by Thatcher and by Reagan, but then depressingly by New Labour, by, the, by, the, by Bill Clinton's Democratic Party, um, and, until it became almost hegemonic, and yet simply denied that it existed. It presented itself as just some sort of law of nature. All we're saying, we're just describing how human society operates. This is what we're like. And it's the worst possible ideology in an age of crisis. Because here we are now faced with these existential crises of climate breakdown, of ecological breakdown, of coronavirus, uh, all sorts of things coming at us left, right and centre. And what you need desperately is activist government, is the state standing up and say, right, OK, it's going to be tough, it's going to be difficult, we're all going to pull together, we're going to make this massive global effort, a community effort, and we're going to get together and tackle these huge issues. But neoliberalism says that's not permitted. State intervention is illegitimate. So it's got to be left to the market. And the market will find a way. Don't worry, new technologies, you know, it'll sort of happen. It's fine. Anyway, this stuff isn't happening anyhow. And it's very interesting to see how this doctrine, which was massively funded from 1947 onwards, by some of the richest people and corporations on earth, spawned the think tanks, the Cato Institute, American Enterprise Institute, the Institute of Economic Affairs, Adam, in Adam Smith Institute, um, uh, 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 Hudson Institute, Heritage Foundation, and many others like them, which were there initially to just spread this doctrine, but became some of the centres of climate science denial. Because, of course, to recognise that this stuff is happening is to recognise that the ideology is flawed. As one of the foremost advocates of neoliberalism, Alan Greenspan eventually had to admit before Congress, there is a flaw, he conceded, when the whole system had collapsed in 2008. Um, and what we see that ideology doing in particular is creating a world which isn't just physically impossible to live in, but I think psychologically impossible to live in as well. Because society doesn't organise itself naturally into economic hierarchies. Especially in public services, say, where people aren't in it just for economic purposes. So what you need is a system which will grade people. You need a system of quantification and assessment and monitoring and surveillance. A system that eventually becomes panoptical. A system which then takes over from the jobs that people are supposed to be doing. So you're constantly filling out assessments and forms and 
um, different means of quantification in order to show where you fit in this great scale, global scale, which has to be created between the virtuous and the vicious. And, um, and, and so our jobs become bullshit jobs, as David Graeber points out. If you don't have a job, you're subject to exactly the same system of perpetual surveillance and monitoring and quantification as anyone who seeks social security will be painfully aware. And you create a system which is just designed for social phobia. And we see social phobias becoming ever more prevalent because um, the what neoliberalism tells us is that it's all about evaluation and competition. We see other people as evaluators and competitors rather than people with whom we might make common cause. And that generates performance anxiety. Um, according to Paul Verhage, this fascinating Belgian psychoanalyst, um, it's a, a major cause of alienation, depression, loneliness. Um, it's as damaging, I believe, this system to our mental well-being as it is to the physical well-being of the only planet we know of that supports life. So this unholy trinity, every part of which has become dependent on the other parts, I believe, and I've come to these beliefs reluctantly, is driving us inexorably towards ruin. And while you can have ecological ruin and indeed social ruin and psychological ruin under other systems, and I believe Soviet communism did all three of those things quite successfully or unsuccessfully, depending on your point of view, we have a, a peculiarly pernicious system which seems to be generating all those things with great speed. And so I believe it's not enough just to fight battles one by one. It's essential, obviously. It's fantastic that people fought off Bristol Airport. It's, I believe people were right to fight HS2. Uh, it's, you know, we should fight every attempt to destroy our precious natural wealth or to grab our precious natural wealth. But unless we take this system on as a system... We will never roll it back. We will always be fighting a rearguard action. It will be constant retrenchment because we are living within the systems that we need to contest. You cannot address structural power with micro-consumerist bollocks. It just doesn't work. You have to take a structural view of the problem and try to displace and replace the ideologies that are driving us, I think, towards ruin. Now, this is where it gets difficult. In the past, people have taken comfort by just being able to take an ideology off the peg and say, I've got a different ism. It's communism, for example. It's socialism, and this has got all the answers. But I think we can see that no existing ism has all the answers, not least because... None of the grand ideologies <clears throat> that we've developed so far puts the living planet front and centre, puts our long-term survival and the survival of our life support systems at the centre of that structure of thought. And I believe that if we're to have any sort of success in getting through this century, not to mention subsequent ones, it has to start from there. It has to start from the position of... We are going to sustain life on earth. That is the number one priority. And everything else becomes subsidiary to that. At the moment, that's the afterthought. The priority is to sustain the capitalist system as someone, and it's never clear who that someone was because um, the more you follow the quote, the more it disappears in, 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 into the mist. But as someone wonderful said, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. Now, our task is to reverse that. We have to imagine the end of capitalism so that the end of the world does not come. And, and, and I think we're beginning to see some of the possible moves 
towards that point. I would very strongly recommend a book which hasn't, I believe, had nearly an, enough recognition so far, but I think, um, in my view, is the most important book written so far this century. Not that I claim to have read all of them, but um, certainly of, of those that I've come across, um, which is called The Patterning Instinct by Jeremy Lent. And this was a book which uh, took me about six months to read because every page I thought, all right, that's just changed my whole life. Better read that again. Um, it's, it's this incredible broad sweep of history. He calls himself a cognitive historian and he looks at neuroscience and psychology, he looks at history, he looks at the way that we frame the world, the deep metaphors we use to navigate it and the way those deep metaphors, which are themselves components of ideologies, then steer us and, and, and send us off in particular directions which are often disastrous. And he calls by contrast to create an ecological civilization. And he has a few pointers as to what that looks like. Obviously starting with this notion that, that our long-term survival comes first and then building the deep metaphors around that idea which then guide our subsequent thinking. So he, he's operating at the sort of deep cognitive level which is where I think a lot of our thinking needs to be and saying... Right, what are those fundamental changes in the way that we see ourselves and the way we see the world? And you know, one of the fundamental changes is a shift towards humility about our place uh, as a species. This whole biblical and pre-biblical notion of dominion that we have been put here by God or someone or something to govern the world and to decide how the world should work is one of the most disastrous deep metaphors uh, that humankind has ever entertained. And in fact, it informs all three of the ideologies that I've mentioned. So he starts to put in place, I think, some of the cognitive structures. And on top of that, I think we can lay a certain set of values. And one of those I like to promote is, is almost the opposite of where capitalism is driving us towards with this quest for universal private luxury, which is what I call private sufficiency, public luxury. While there's not enough space for everyone to have their own tennis court and swimming pool and art gallery and playground, there is enough space for us to have magnificent tennis courts and swimming pools and art galleries and playgrounds in the public domain. And by creating those things, far from taking away resources and space from other people, you open them up to other people. And the more we can start to share public assets and natural wealth, then the more chance we have of everybody achieving a decent quality of life uh, without actually bursting through the planetary boundaries. And this takes me on to Kate Rayworth's wonderful Donut Economics, where she has produced a kind of economic schema which describes what that world would look like in diagrammatic form um, of her donut with the inner ring being the uh, ring through which no one should fall, um, basically set by the social development goals. Everyone should have good health, good education, good nutrition, uh, democratic rights, gender rights, etc., um, no one should fall through that hole. And then the outer ring set by the planetary boundaries and we construct our economic life within that. It's not a complete story because it's a schema. It tells you where the boundaries of economic life should lie. Um, but of course, what we've got to do then is to fill in that space and say, what does economic life look like within it? And I think this takes us potentially to another principle which again is the opposite of one of those uh, I mentioned under capitalism, which is this idea that your money translates into your rights to grab natural wealth, which is that everyone should have the equal right to the enjoyment of natural wealth. That's not the possession of natural wealth, but the enjoyment of natural wealth, and enjoyment should come before possession. So we can start to look at how systems could change to ensure that works not only within a generation, 
but intergenerationally as well. A further human right we would introduce is every generation should have the same right to enjoy natural wealth as preceding generations. So it's not an ism, but you can begin to see some of the building blocks slotting into place. And one of the big changes, which I think is very positive, is that I hope no one's looking to a grand old man scratching his beard to come up with all the answers. I don't think anyone has all the answers. The world is actually far too complicated for one person to have all the answers. When one person thinks they've got all the answers, whether it's Karl Marx or Friedrich Hayek, the, the, what they lay down is a route to disaster because of the tremendous complexity. But as a community of minds, as a system of minds, we can cope with tremendous complexity. And so rather than coming here to say, I have the answer, it is the following, here is the screed, here are the 20 principles which create a new ism and new ideology. I've come here to say, I've got a few, I think, of them, but I need a whole lot of the hive mind to come together to fill in the rest of that picture. And one of the things I hope we can do in the second half is to begin that process. Thank you very much.